Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm sorry, I seem to sound like a frog instead of a lemur today. But it's an amazing thing to be here today, to be here yesterday and the day before. What an extraordinary program we've had. And it says there that I'm going to talk about lemurs for the next 50 years, because I realized when it was, for some reason, I said 10. That was a very, 10 goes by real quick. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to just kind of start at the beginning 50 years ago. I was in here 50 years ago, but when I started here. And I, I'm going to tell you a couple stories. And then I'm going to tell you a lot about what's going on in Madagascar, not in the west side, which you've heard a lot about, but more on the east side of Madagascar. We came to the Duke Primate Center, now called the Duke Lemur Center. <laughs> and lemurs changed our lives. That's your ganser there. That's me. That's Andrea Katz. That's Peter Kapler. That's Linda Taylor. We just came to do a study, you know. It was an easy place to work. It wasn't going to be a lifelong journey. Yes, we came to the Duke Lemur Center, and we changed the lives of lemurs. Had no idea this was in our future. At that time, Alwyn Simons had just taken over as a director. And Ken Glander had already been here. And they began to dream impossible dreams, really controversial, revolutionary stuff they were talking about. They were talking about taking lemurs and putting them out in the forest in these outdoor enclosures. That didn't happen in zoos at that time. And, and it worked. The lemurs loved them. First there was the, the, you know, the first one, and now I think, I don't know, there's a lot of them. And I think the lemurs are very happy out there. But then Dr. Simons began to think about what was here at the Primate Center and what it should be. He, we, he, we, he began to think about going to Madagascar and getting lemurs to bring back here for breeding colonies. And that was pretty revolutionary. And more than revolutionary, it was difficult. We know that Madagascar had a very socialist government for over a decade, and, and not many Westerners were even allowed to go to Madagascar. And he wanted to go to Madagascar and bring lemurs back. But he felt very strongly about that because he felt that there was a lot of destruction going on in Madagascar and maybe they needed a place as a shelter in case they all went extinct. The other controversial and outrageous thing that the Duke Lemur Center did is they decided that they would take lemurs from captivity and restock Madagascar. They would take Varicia variegata, who were doing quite well here in the United States, and bring them back to Bitampoon to see if we could actually augment the genetic makeup of the ones in the wild. That was a crazy idea. Nobody thought it would work. And of course, I think both Alwyn and Ken we're, th we're thinking about building the army of lemurologists that we became. And we were kind of recruited. And we were recruited to do a lot of things around the Duke Lemur Center. We had to plant bamboo, we had to do a little gardening, and then we had to feed the lemurs every once in a while. It was a very, it was a very uh, different feeling than, of course, it is today. But it was the beginning of something really amazing. And a lot of Duke students made it happen too. And I can't, I can't underestimate how many Duke students have gone on to become conservationists and, and uh, really appreciate uh, lemurs, even to this day.
Okay. So, you know the, how the story goes. Lemurs got to Madagascar before all the other taxa. Well, Duke also arrived rather early in the game. <laughs> And there weren't very good roads in those days. I don't know that you can recognize them, but that's David Myers there and Patrick Dan Daniels and me totally stuck in the mud. And we were searching for pro lemur Simus at that point in time. And as the story goes, we found him, and we found a new species of science too. And then we had to have found a national park to save them. And we did that in 1991, and then it became part of the World Heritage Site in 2007. Again, the incubation for all this, the real foundation of all this, was here, right here at Duke Lemur Center. Duke Lemur Center, the second line of defense. That's what Alwyn would say. We need to rescue lemurs from extinction and have a refuge so far from Madagascar. And, and we all kind of believed him. And one of my, my, my uh, undergraduate students decided to go to Madagascar with me when I was going over in 1985. And I came back to teach my class. And David, David continued on because he had graduated from Duke and he went to the 1985 conservation meeting, and then he kept on going. And suddenly he got to the northern part of Madagascar, and he was so shocked by the burning and by the devastation that he called up Dr. Simons and he said, there's extraordinary lemurs here, absolutely beautiful lemurs that are gonna go extinct. They're these blue-eyed black lemurs, Please, can I bring them back? They're on this peninsula, and most of them are, go are going. Can I bring them back to the Duke Primate Center to found a breeding colony? And Dr. Simon said, okay, I'll start working on the permits. And then David called his mother, and he said, Mom, I'm in love. She's blonde. She's blue-eyed, and I'm bringing her home. <laughs> and they've been doing pretty well, those black-eyed, blue-eyed, <laughs> blue-eyed black lemurs. <laughs> and then I think, this is our, my second story, I think probably the thing that I'm the most proud of, of all the th times I've been working in Madagascar, is the fact that I'm the person that brought the first eye eyes to the United States of America. It was amazing, because, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Simons called me into his office. He said, okay, I want you to go to Madagascar and get some eye eyes. Nobody's ever, I never brought them to these states before. It's your job. I said, okay. He says, it's easy. You know, you go out into the forest, and you look around till you see a nest. You know, it's a big leaf nest. And then all you have to do is just send out one of the local people. They can climb trees. And then when they get to the top, they'll be able to stick their hand in the nest, pull out the eye, -eye put it in a sack, and you got it. And I thought that was, yeah, okay. So I took, I took Patrick Daniels with me. And we got, uh, we got to Tana and realized that Mananai Nord, which is the only place that the eye eyes were known at that time. You know, that's the time when Jean-Jacques Peter had taken nine to Nosy, excuse me, Nosy Manga Bay um, because he thought that they were all going to be extinct on the mainland. So we had to take a private plane up to Mananai Nord, and they cost a lot then, as they do now. So I made arrangements with the, with the pilot that he had to come back in exactly one month, that I'd have the animals by that time. And if I got him sooner, I'd try to call him. Those days, even though the phones didn't work very well. Okay, so get up there. Walked out first, first night, first day, actually, and uh, saw a nest right away, no problem. I sent somebody up. He set, put his hand in the nest, and he didn't have 
any eye eye when he has his hand out. So, found the next nest. He went up. No eye eye in that nest either. In fact, it was 134 nests later, and we didn't have one eye eye. And, and the plane was coming back. I mean, I was, oh my. And then suddenly, we got lucky. That night, we got an eye eye, a male eye eye. And the next day, we actually got a second eye eye, and it was also a male which created an issue. Because <laughs> I was supposed to go get a breeding colony. And that wasn't going to work. But I had an ethical dilemma. I mean, I could just let him go again. Uh, I couldn't. I couldn't. I, I'd work too hard for those two. I was going to bring him back, and then, you know, we'll see what happens later. OK, so we have two very large uh, dog kennels that I brought with me. Put one eye eye in each one, flew back to Tana, got all the paperwork for them, it's as much paperwork as the weight of the animals, and we got on the plane, Air France, and we get to Paris, and I never have seen such an angry stewardess in my life as that stewardess that was storming up to me. And she said, ah. she was too angry to even say anything, and she pointed to dog kennel. And you know eye eyes. They kind of have sharp teeth. And they had gnawed a hole at the top of that kennel. And this eye eye is head <laughs> up above. And he's looking around with his floppy ears saying, this is Paris. Ah. <laughs> and I just, I just was very calm. And I said to the stewardess not to worry. And I walked up to the cage and I put the palm of my hand on the top of his head and just pushed him down. <laughs> then I grabbed the duct tape that I had, never leave home without it, and I wrapped duct tape around that big dog kennel. And I explained to the stewardess that, you know, it had been night while we were traveling up to Paris, but now it was day and he wouldn't, he'd just sleep until he got to Durham. <sighs> Believe it or not, he did. <laughs> it was OK. So I got him back to Duke. And Dr. Simons was like, you're, you say you're a biologist, and you bring me two males. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I said I had to go back. So I had to teach first. And I, and finally, I went back to Madagascar to get two females. This time, you know, got two females right away. It was a mother and a baby female. And then I had, I really had a responsibility. So we had to get him back to the Duke Primate Center as soon as possible. But this time, my ticket was British Air. So I could get Air, Air Madagascar to Nairobi, no problem. But as soon as I went to British Air, they said, what's that a animal you got with you? And I said, oh, I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, <laughs> Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of an animal it is. You don't have reservations, and, and number one. And number two, any animal has to be six months quarantined in Heathrow before it can go on. I started to cry. I said, this is, this is one of the most endangered animals on earth. You can't, you can't, you can't tell me that you're not going to take this animal. And, and then he said, go to KLM. They like animals. So I went up to KLM. I was a wreck, you know. There was tears down my eyes. When I was over. And I, so I went up, got, got myself together, and I said, um, I, I, British Air told me to come over here. I have a British Air ticket, but I want to go to um, Durham, North Carolina, and I have some animals here. They're sort of like cats. <laughs> and, you know, they have quarantine, and, and, and they're rare, and, and they can't. And he said, let me see him. We know what an eye eye looks like. <laughs> but he insisted. And I pulled up the curtain. You know, I had a lambda over the, over the cage. And he, and, and he said, I know that animal. That's an eye eye. 
And I said, how do you know? And he pulled out from behind the podium Allison Jolly's National Geographic article. It was, you know, I hadn't seen it yet. I didn't even know it was coming out. And he pointed to the eye eye inside and he said, because it's that animal. And I said, yes, it is. And he said, but, but Dr. Wright, um, you know, this is August in Nairobi. We don't have any seats available until maybe September 15th. I, we're fully booked. This is the high tourist season. And I really started to cry. And he said, but, but this animal is very special. I think this animal deserves to go first class. <laughs> I'd never gone first class before. I couldn't believe it. I was sitting there in the front, <laughs> this big chair. My eye is right directly in front of me. And uh, also on a chair, and the stewardess comes up, and she says, "Would you like some champagne?" And I said, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, uh, "Would you like some grapes and some cheese?" I said, "And then she said, "And our friends, what would they like?" And I said, "Oh, it's okay. I've already fed them, because in my pocket I had mealworms." And I had fed him. At that time, we had no idea that I eyes, you know, had ate anything but grubs. Okay, so she comes back. I must have fallen asleep. She comes back and she says, "That's a primate, isn't it?" I said, "Yes." And she said, it, "It must eat bananas." And she put a banana in front of the cage, and that mother grabbed the banana, pulled it inside the cage and ate the whole thing but the peel, not the peel. I, w I was amazed. That was the first time we knew that I eyes actually ate fruit sometimes. So that was a, you know, a scientific discovery. <laughs> and then she came back and she said, you know, that cage is kind of small. See, by now she had full confidence that she understood more about eye eyes than I did. <laughs> and she said, why don't you open the cage door and let them out? You can tell this is before 2001. <laughs> and I said, no, I said, no, this is first class and you would, you know, no, it's like your other uh, guest might not like it. I fell asleep again, she came back and she said, I've asked every one of them and they all think it's a great idea. <laughs> So I opened the cage just a little bit because, because she, you know, she was so insistent. And the little baby eye was so excited. And it came up and he was on my head and he was sticking his finger in my ear. I'm so I'm lucky I can hear. And then <laughs> crawled all around. The mother didn't want to have a thing to do without coming out of the cage. Every two hours she grabbed the baby, pulled it in for some nursing, and then let it come out again. It was an incredible trip. But I think... I think the most exciting part of that trip is when we got back to Duke. Now those eye eyes, those two males that were in separate cages had been silent for all this time when they were alone. And when those females came into the primate center, all of a sudden the males started calling, the females started answering, and it was just incredible. And I guess the best thing is, of course, it's been a rather successful colony now, hasn't it? How many babies are there, 32? Something like that, 34? I don't know the, big, the number, but I know that we have had a lot of I.I. babies. So I'm very proud of this accomplishment of the Duke Lever Center. And, uh, and I think in our 50 years of celebration, we have to celebrate those I.I.s. They did a good job. So I, I just wanted to mention that incredible uh, restocking program too, because that was an adventure in itself with John Cleese coming over and filming the, the BBC. Uh, sort of a, was like faulty towers really almost, but it was an, an amazing experience where everything failed at the beginning, where the, these captive animals, off in the wild, just suddenly, 
got eaten by the FUSA. But you know, the one thing about Madagascar is you got to be persistent. So it succeeded in the end, and now the, the genetics has been, uh, has been in increased and enhanced. Enhanced is the word. So I think having those Carolina Five go over was wonderful, and Charlie Welch in particular should be uh, complimented for that extraordinary adventure. The whole DLC team is pretty amazing. Um, especially I wanted to shout out uh, Patrick Daniels as well as, as Andrea and Charlie for all the work that they've done in Madagascar over these years. But I also want to mention the fossils because this is such an extraordinary place. Not only do you have the living lemurs, but here at the Division of Fossil Primates, you also have all of the extinct ones. And so that's pretty amazing too. A great place to do research. It's sort of the, it, Alwyn was particularly interested in the history of the extinctions and now Greg Gunnell is taking over his place. As Jonah said, the number of lemur species has increased from 32 to, he said, 110. So we've got a lot more species than we used to have. And that's for, we also have a lot more lemur researchers than we used to have. I'm very proud to see all of you out there and to see that we have an army of people that are willing to go forward and help protect these animals into the future. And then protected areas, I think he said 120. I guess he's probably right. So I'm proud of Duke because all of this really started here. And, and it continues to be a gateway, I was going to say a gateway drug, but I <laughs> a gateway, an inspiration for lemur lovers of the future. And the DLC lemurs themselves are ambassadors. How many people have I seen that said, I got interested in lemurs when I went to Duke and saw those animals out in the trees? Not everybody can go to Madagascar, but a lot more people are inspired to go to Madagascar after they see the lemurs here. And I'm very proud that Duke continues to inspire uh, students to go over from Duke University itself. Uh, there, we had three uh, students over from Duke this year. There's some of the Sava, the people that went to Sava. It's fantastic. So over the years, all of us have grown up and prospered. We have Peter Kepler, students are in the West, and Peter's still there too. Your Gonsort students in the south, and Jorg is still there too. And Pat Wright students in the east, and all of them have spread up the east coast, so there's a lot, a lot of them. And, um, and Bob Sussman's and Allison's in the south. And so from just a few of the, the founders, so to speak, we really have an amazing group. And we can't forget Chirp. I mean, that is such a phenomenon. There's over 200 members and all the, tr the, the wonderful primatologists that have come out of that organization, of uh, Madame Barrett's and Jonas. The bad news, of course, is in the IOUCN meeting, we found out that many more of the animals were critically endangered and endangered than we knew because we hadn't been counting for a while. In fact, 94% of the lemurs are on the red list. And then we put together a lemur action plan there at Sandro Valbio. And we, this plan was, was published in science, so that's pretty good. And what it mentioned was that one of the best things to do for conservation is have a research station because it generates, it's long term. I mean, the Sandro Valbio started in what, 1980 something. And so did uh, Corindi, even far longer than that. So Corindi and Centerville Bio stand as sort of like uh, hubs of, of radiation, of research and, and uh, tourism together. And the research stations also can build capacity. And I know the TBA has been in Corindi. I know uh, York has had an incredible number of, uh, of Malagasy uh, researchers. We have two training, training, training for the Malagasy to uh, save lemurs in the future. And then we talked a lot about the West and, and uh, reforestation in the West, so I feel really obligated to talk a little bit about uh, the East Coast, because I have a very different experience than York. You know, we started 
I'm planning out um, lemur, uh, actually lemur droppings about a long time ago. We were doing an experiment on, on seed dispersal. We planted out these trees after the experiment and those trees started fruiting and flowering in 15 years. These are rainforest trees, endemic species. So in the, wet, in the east anyway, I do think that we can make corridors that will be worthwhile to lemurs pretty quick. 15 years is not a very long time. And they're fruiting and flowering. And, and I think, of course, as everybody thinks, that it's more, very important to make these forests profitable so they don't burn them down or cut them down. And so what we're trying to do in our side of the island is to, under the, underneath these trees, is to plant, uh, to plant crops, really. You know, vanilla, wild pepper, cinnamon. These are spices that are getting a high price right now. And I've checked with the spice traders, and they say they'll get a high price for years to come. So we're hoping that we can build new forests that lemurs will love and that people will love too. I think conservation, with the best conservation, is based on research. I think we've heard a lot of that here today. I think that the Sava project that is up there in Marajesi, which is absolutely beautiful, National Park, is, is a wonderful project. And DLC should be very, very proud of it. I think that the DLC also has an incredible ability to, to, to show the media how great me, uh, lemurs are. I mean, the IMAX film, that first scene was filmed here at the Duke Lemur Center. Those are Duke Lemur animals there. And I think it's important to get the word out to, uh, to more than just a few people, uh, and that's the that I think that's, that's Charlie and Andrea and Hantra and a lot of people. And also, we have other people, Duke people, like the Crap Brothers, who started here as undergraduates and then ended up inspiring a whole generation of people to do science and to conserve animals, especially lemurs, so Zuba Mafu. So I, I love DLC. You know, it, it believes in the integrated approach to the future of lemurs. If what's been happening here in the last two days is this kind of, of, of mixture of all these different, really, disciplines working together to find out about lemurs and then to protect them. I mean, it's, I love to see all the field work and the laboratory work combining together. That didn't happen in the beginning. And the community-based conservation with sustainable development. And understanding lemurs, that the cognition work is so important. They were really misunderstood when I started out. I didn't even know what lemurs were. And I, I had my PhD in primatology because I wasn't taught anything about lemurs. And of course, the genomic stuff. The genomic stuff is so very exciting. And with the possibilities of these medical opportunities, I think that's very important for, for the future. So the Duke Lemur Center is an incredible incubator. And I think that that gives me hope that we can save together. We could save these lemurs for the future. And I want to thank all of this army of students who have, uh, have, who have projects now in, in Madagascar. And even my recent students, which I hope, who I hope will have projects soon. But especially, I, I have a few people to shout out now, and one of them is Benjamin. Let's give him a hand. I mean, Benjamin was just a child when I saw him the first time. He didn't even speak very much English. And now we're all, we all know Benjamin, and, and he's all helped us out of a situation or two, and I'm really glad that he's here today. And I'm so glad that Jonah is here too, you know, he's my first Malagasy student, I'm very proud of him. And, and, and to think that this all started with Peter Klopfer and John Butner Janish, you know, just having this kind of, 
the thing that he, that Peter talked about in the beginning. But I wanted to add a footnote on what Peter Clawford said at the first at the beginning of this whole project, of this whole uh, whatever this has been festival celebration. Who, you know, I had lunch with Richard Leakey a couple days before I got here. And Richard Leakey said to me, oh, you're going to the Duke Lemur Center. Yeah, I think uh, I had a lot to do with that. I said, Richard, what are you talking about? You had anything to do with the Duke Lemur Center. He said, I was 17 years old, and I needed money. And I, and Butner Yanis said he needed bush babies. So I captured those first Crassacaudetto for Butner Yanish when he was at Yale. And those eventually got back, came here as the first animals. So I guess everybody had a hand in <laughs> creating the, the Lemur Center. But Anne, oh my God, Anne. I mean, what an incredible, incredible job she's done, hasn't she? I mean, she took this place. She took this place when it was on the verge of extinction. I mean, none of us thought it had a chance. And she used her charm and her wisdom and her strategic way, and she made this place sing. Oh my God, I'm so proud. I'm so proud, Anne, and you must be too. The Duke Lemur Center, it's gonna live forever. Thank you. <laughs>